Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Hickerton. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Lincoln, and I'm delighted to welcome you to episode seven of our Resilient Lincolnshire series, Business Beyond the Curve. Um, today, we are going to be talking to um, leaders from the military world, and we are here really because we set up this online platform to ensure that during this difficult period, we remain in contact, we communicate, and we collaborate with our partners in Lincolnshire and beyond. Now, for those of you who've been following this series, you'll know it's in two streams. We have the executive education stream, which is uh, live every week. And the beyond the curve, and people see the curve in different ways. It could be the change curve or the change spectrum, if you call it the webinar Wednesday. Uh, the curve, we're all trying to flatten. Um, and it's a different way of looking at things in terms of building resilience across uh, individuals, organizations, and indeed the county. Um, now, Lincolnshire, as we know, has got very strong connections with the military, known as Bomber County. And only last November, if you can remember those heady days, we had a very large event at RF Waddington, where we talked to the military around what military and civilian world could learn from each other. And it's bringing this up to date for the coronavirus times. And hence, we've got some fabulous guests I'll introduce in a moment. But first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Craig Marsh. And Craig is head of the business school. And good, morning. good morning, Craig. How are you today? Oh, good. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Um, many people who are tuning in for the first time may not be aware of some of the links that the university has with the military. Would you like just to share a few of those, please, with our... Yeah, so for well, thanks. I mean, they are uh, they're close and they're varied. You may expect that from from being uh, the, the University of, of Lincolnshire. Um, but uh, we have uh, probably over a thousand students, military students, on our uh, distance learning programs, um, which uh, which is a which is a, a huge uh, asset for us as a university, and of course a massive value for the for the for the military. Uh, we are under the employer recognition scheme. We're a gold covenant holder. There are only actually two of those in uh, in Lincolnshire, and that's a, that's the university, if you like, as a business that supports um, the, uh, the, 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 the the transfer, if you like, and the support of skills development and, and transfer of employees into the university. Um, we have our cadets, of course, uh, on all three branches that uh, that we support from our uh, from our student body, and we we also do quite a lot of research in the military from some of the. Uh, technical engineering research through to the work that, uh, that that I do on 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 leadership. So so the relationship is 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 close, uh, multivaried, and and I think a, a very strong partnership. Fantastic to hear, and it's obviously very timely that we have this conversation. So I'm going to introduce the guests, and I'll hand over to you, Craig. So firstly, we have Soraya Marshall. Good morning, Soraya. Good morning. Good morning. Soraya is an Air Commodore in the Royal Air Force and is Commandant at RAF Cranwell. We are also joined by uh, Julian Free. Uh, good morning, Julian. Um, Julian is a retired Major General, um, and he's very much not retired anymore as Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the University of Lincoln. And we're also joined by Gordon Judd. And we're delighted to have Gordon with us following a distinguished military career. Gordon now works in the private department of the CAE as Global Business Development Lead for Synthetic Environments. So Craig, I'm going to hand over to you to lead the conversation and I will join you again at the end for a wrap up. Thank you very much. Many thanks indeed, Martin. And, uh, and I think perhaps we can kick off our conversation just by uh, building a little bit on Martin's uh, introduction and just inviting each of our guests to uh, say a little bit more about, about themselves. And, uh, and perhaps also just to give a quick overview uh, of, of how you're seeing uh, the current situation from your particular uh, standing as a, as a senior leader. So. Um, so, Soraya, Soraya Marshall, may I, I bring you in first and uh, perhaps just say a little bit about, about what your role entails and, and, and just give us a, a couple of minutes of, of how you're seeing things right now, Soraya? Thanks, Craig. Um, okay, so I'm Commandant at uh, Cranwell, which is a, a slightly confusing name. I've actually, sort of within my enterprise, got three sort of specific pillars. Uh, the first one is uh, aimed at inspiring and attracting, uh, and that incorporates our Youth and STEM programme. Uh, aimed at sort of 11 to 14 year olds and obviously tied in with schools trying to inspire and infuse uh, STEM subjects amongst our school population. Uh, we obviously collaborate on the Air and Defence College as well and we've got our university air squadrons. So in terms of uh, how that has gone over the last couple of months, a significant change really with all of the schools and universities clearly closing during lockdown. Um, so much of that activity has ceased, although we've been rapidly trying to get sort of things going virtually. 
uh, both on the university air squad news and also with uh, the youth and STEM programs, really sort of supporting the homeschooling and the schools and sending out uh, kits and uh, activities really for people to get engaged with whilst they're locked down, which is great. Uh, the second pillar is uh, training all those uh, who enter the Royal Air Force. So obviously at Cranwell, that's the officers, but also down at uh, Royal Air Force Holton, all of our recruit training as well. Uh, now that has continued and we've had to uh, continue delivering that output um, right from the start of lockdown because it's a critical uh, means of feeding our front line and obviously maintaining our military outputs. That has been difficult, you know, we've had to adapt our training really very, very rapidly to try and incorporate as much of the government guidelines as we possibly can, trying to protect our people and reduce the risk for them whilst still striving to uh, maintain an outfit. Uh, and the final pillar is the sort of the postgraduate pillar, I call it, uh, which is to develop leadership and resilience through all people uh, in the Royal Air Force, through the Tedder Academy and the Robson Academy of uh, Leadership. Again, much of that activity has ceased in terms of the training that we deliver, especially the adventures training and the, and the outdoor activities, clearly with lockdown. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of work to try and support our personnel in the Royal Air Force, certainly on the leadership side and the resilient side through virtual meetings, webinars, etc. Um, so I would say that uh, you know the lockdown has acted as a catalyst, really, to help us shift a lot of our training into the virtual space, which was always an aspiration, uh, but this has definitely let us on a few years. Fantastic, that's right. And actually, I think as a university, we would absolutely recognise that, uh, that that catalytic effect, if, if we can call it that, of, of moving uh, and becoming, I think, perhaps more innovative, actually, in the way that we conceive of our training. So that's perhaps something we could, we could, that we could dig into a little bit more over the course of... Uh, of this conversation, so uh, so thank you so much, Soraya, and and Gordon, uh, can I can I bring you in at that point, and and from um, from your perspective for, as a as a as a business and a business very much engaged with uh, with military, how, how are you say a little bit about yourself, of course, and your role, and, and how are you seeing things just at this point, Gordon? Sorry, Greg, uh, if that was me, it's very difficult line, and um, just not if it was for me, because I think I got the gist of what the question was. Yeah, no problem. Just a, a, a quick overview. Just say a little bit about about your uh, your own role and your position, uh, and then perhaps how you're doing things at this point. Okay, on that, on that basis, the uh, probably the part of what I have in today's discussion is that uh, my company, in conjunction with an MAD project team and, and one of the IT startups in London, has been has been looking to provide a single synthetic environment. Uh, primarily to a military customer uh, for operational decision support uh, and course of action analysis. But evidently, as this year has gone by, uh, it has become quite apparent that the, the nature of that information is going to be played into government space, particularly for uh, resilience and the ability to... Um, Gordon, I'm really sorry, but it's actually... It's, 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 I'm sorry, it's a real struggle to hear you. I, I wonder if, um, would you mind perhaps just trying to dialing out and uh, and coming back in again? That might improve your connection. Uh, but I'm sure our listeners are having a really hard time understanding. I, I do apologise, but perhaps you could just, just tell me. We were talking about bandwidth a little earlier on, weren't we? Would you mind doing that? And then we'll see if we can pick it up and I'll come back to you in a little bit. Is that okay? That's brilliant. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Julian, then perhaps uh, while we waited to, for Gordon to reconnect, um, I, I think we'll, we're working with your university hat on to today as opposed to your previous career but obviously a lot of military experience and perhaps to say a little bit about about your position your background and and also again you know how, how are you seeing things right now yes yeah, certainly craig um so yes at the university i'm uh, the deputy vice chancellor with real responsibility for people's services and operations um i guess the key part in terms of what we're talking about today is that I tend to be the incident manager. So all the COVID um, reaction, if you like, has, has sort of come under the incident management team, which, uh, which I chair, I wouldn't say I lead it all, um, uh, and try to pull together all the various strands of the things that we're, uh, we're doing. I think quite interesting because, you know, I've, if you use the KPMG framework that they sort of use to try and address COVID, uh, where they have sort of four areas of react, uh, resilience, recovery, renewal and new reality. I think they're really quite useful um, in this particular instance. I mean, I think the react phase, much as uh, Soraya mentioned, you know, we turned the university around um, very, very quickly to get into that digital environment. So 
uh, one of the areas of my responsibility, ICT and all our digital stuff comes under that. And I would say I've spent two and a half years trying to get people to use the tools to largely no effect. Uh, and within two days, everybody's online streaming, Zooming, uh, Teams meetings, this sort of stuff. Uh, and so introduce a bug uh, or the threat of disease and death and uh, amazing what people can do in the, envi in the uh, digital environment. So yeah, like always, you just need a bit of threat, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. The, uh, I think we well, already have. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, was, um, it was really impressive to see. And it was right across the university, you know, and, and uh, innovation, the adaptability, flexibility is fantastic. And you think that just a couple of months ago, we were running university, you know, with 2000 odd staff, 16,000 students with everybody in. We're now running the same thing with everybody out. So I go into the university um, fairly regularly and, you know, it is just security staff and cleaning and that sort of stuff going on there uh, and essential maintenance so that we can uh, reoccupy when we need to. But those two extremes uh, really reflect the um, how much has had to be done and, and be done really fast and how people have picked that up. And I think as always with those two extremes, neither one of them is probably the right answer. So the next part of what we're uh, looking at is really what uh, what should our shape be? How should we be set up uh, when we return? Because you don't want to throw away everything that we've learned in the last uh, in the last few weeks. And indeed, there are a lot of upsides actually as well to some of the things we're doing. So the sort of second bit of that is around the resilience. Um, really, that's what we're uh, what we've been doing, trying to make sure that everything is available to people. They can carry on their education journey. Can uh, people can do the work that they need to do, the research, and so on? Uh, and also building into the system resilience in the staff, which I think is also going to be really important because we are likely to have to go back into lockdown at some stage. Uh, so we need to be planning for that now, not be surprised by it again. Um, and that means putting resilience into the staff so that we've got rotor systems and so on. So that's a bit there. Recovery key, obviously, uh, and a lot of forward planning now about recovery uh, in terms of what the budgets and everything else look like, reducing costs and so on. And so how we're trying to do that. Uh, and then I think the, the final piece, the renewal and new reality, that's a really important piece is that that is where now uh, everyone's made this switch. Um, we know that our students are really um, well connected uh, and talk not only to their own peer group, but those immediately above and below them. And so competition is going to be interesting uh, i think because it's going to change because not only is it have you got a great location which we know we have and we know we you know it sells really well but how did your university react to going into lockdown what was the provision like how exciting was the provision online all of those things so it's it's going to be really competitive and although we've done the flip now we really need to increase the quality right across the board and the innovation in terms of the delivery. So I think there's some huge things that are going on uh, there that we've got to get our head around. Yeah. And then just, uh, so last word, just say that I'm also trying to support uh, a couple of chief execs in the NHS as well as they try to deal with the impact on their staff and their delivery and how to do and lead in that because it's quite a new situation for them where they're actually putting people in where they may... Uh, well, they're taking huge physical risk and may die. So, and indeed have. So, that, that these are unusual challenges for quite a lot of the sector or different sectors as well, which they haven't had to face before. Which those of us in the military um, and who've spent a lot of time on operations, as uh, as people in my school era tend to have done, uh, have had to face. So, there's quite a lot there, I think. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for the overview, Julian. And perhaps the, the I mean, what's interesting, one of the many interesting things you mentioned was the uh, was the KPMG four set model. That might be something that. We could just perhaps unpick a little bit more because I'm sure that might be of interest to some of our uh, business colleagues if they've not already come across that. And I know it guided us uh, as we've been working through our own university response. So, uh, so thank you for that, Julian. And uh, just to, if I may, uh, Gordon, uh, how, how's the connection going? Can we bring you back in? <laughs> He's going to type his response to it by the looks of it. Gordon, can you hear me? All right. It sounds like Gordon's still having a few connection problems, so we'll we'll, we'll try and bring him back in uh, just as soon as we can uh, we can get again. We're all discussing the, uh, the, the 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 key resource in our households, which is bandwidth. I think we've all been suffering from that a little bit with uh, with young adults in the in the house, especially. So uh, so we'll bring Gordon back in on that one. And um, Soraya, so maybe if I can come back to you because there were so many different areas that that you covered in in your in introduction there, and uh, I think one of the things that we've we've just sort of spotted as a sort of common. Um, if you like, challenge or opportunity that uh, the university and uh, and 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 the, your areas of responsibility have covered is the idea of 
um, of, of moving education into a into a, a, more, a, a different space, if I can just sort of broadly call it that. And so you, you mentioned that you've been doing an awful lot to where you can um, to to move your um, to your your students at different levels into uh, into a space which is uh, a more blended option with, with virtual office available to them. It, 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 do you, are you seeing that as as a as a permanent shift, or are you seeing it as a kind of temporary response to current crisis, and therefore you would uh, and that perhaps needs a slightly different answer depending on the population, but but as something that you would see as returning to normal at some point. So how, how you how are you seeing that that education? So um, I think certainly within the air force specifically, but also across wider defence, there's been a big push to try and really modernise our methods of training uh, and capitalise on technology. Um, and that was a process that's sort of been churning along in the background. Um, and at Cranwell, we've been doing a lot of that. Actually, we've got a brand new officer training course starting in in, in August of this year, which is hugely uh, modernised and uh, technologically enabled. Um, so it's it's been an aspiration. I think, as I say, this has helped us get after it much more rapidly. Um, so, uh, you know, through necessity. Um, and uh, so I think it is here to stay. And I think one of the big, uh, I mean, you can move that outside of the training environment uh, as well. And so just ways of working. I think, again, there's been an appetite and an aspiration to get around, to get after more flexible ways of working, recognising that the families are different, people's pressures are different, to give people more choice and really modernise as an organisation. Um, and all of these changes have been happening and we've been moving towards that. But again, I think this is, you know, there's still a culture of being in work all day, every day in the military. And I think that has fundamentally changed kind of overnight. Um, and I um, and I know that we will not go back to the old ways of doing things. I think you know the benefits of being able to be more flexible, uh, be that training meetings, less travel, kind of more capacity um, in terms of what we deliver as individuals. I think you know we're, there are some really good lessons that have come out of uh, you know this this kind of crisis that will that will endure. That, that's great. And, and Julian um, referred to this um, this ana analogy. Sorry, if I may stay with you for a second. Uh, the, the, this analogy that we're, 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 we're it feels a bit like being in wartime, and I, we hear a lot in the press, don't we, about this uh, you know this, this response to what to, to a threat that, that has analogies to, to, to wartime situations. Is that something that you would recognise as a senior military leader? Is, is there is the analogy a good one? Are there some differences there? I think it, it works a little bit, but there are definitely some difference, differences. I think, you know, in the military, clearly, uh, we are trained and equipped and ready to deal with crisis to go on operations. Um, I think, um, you know, this idea of an operational footing um, helps, you know, in a moment of crisis, we move on to an operational footing. It focuses the mindset. It perhaps um, allows people to understand and cope better with the situation that they're in. I think our management um, is very well trained. We've got this sort of command and control that uh, is sort of scalable, agile and pretty resilient, which kind of helps us. So these are all kind of operationally focused um, things uh, that work, you know, in, in moments of crisis. Uh, but on the flip side, I think, you know, in, in the military, a lot of us are used to going away, deploying on operations and, and you prepare for that. You, you know, leave your families behind. Um, and when you're out there, you can focus 100% on the task in hand. Uh, whereas, of course, this is different. This crisis is at home. Uh, there's a risk to our family, perhaps by going to work and maintaining a critical output, in fact, cre increasing the risk to your family. So these are all new concerns that, that I don't think we're used to dealing with in an operational sense. Um, so I think, yeah, that analogy works in some ways. Um, and I think the military is very well equipped to deal with it. But I think there are some key differences. Yeah. It's enjoyed. I mean, the, the, you mentioned the development of, uh, of the new officer training, which is very much a, a, a technology oriented. You must be thinking that's quite serendipitous, given <laughs> what's happened actually over the last the last couple of months or so. We had a similar situation at the university. We launched uh, fully online programs in January, and I think, well, that was fantastic planning. But of course, uh, that's what we would claim, wouldn't it? Um, Julian, you, you, you mentioned. I, I, I was curious to see. I don't think you specifically uh, talked about it, but but you, you obviously had a, a long career in the middle of chairs. Is it something that you found? From a personal point of view, has has helped you in the, in this current crisis? Have you, have you relied on sort of military training as you've been working with the university to respond to the crisis? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think so. I mean, I I just pick up on um, Sarah's point there. I think the fast difference about going away, where you just absolutely a shutter goes down and you ain't worried about anything behind you, uh, and you're just focused uh, and and do what you need to do wherever it is that you're you are in the world, and and that is a key difference here, where you've got people. 
uh, around you who, you know, loved ones who are also maybe under um, under some sort of threat, which you don't normally have. Um, but in terms of uh, that military experience, yeah, it does, because I think it gives you one, uh, you know, you are taught, rehearsed, exercised, tested um, on planning, uh, thinking through, looking at other uh, problems from different ways, trying to garner information from different sources, different people. Um, I, I, I sort of, you'll have heard me say this before, but I think the, uh, one of the great quotes uh, or great lines from a guy called Shimon Nave, he was an Israeli um, brigadier and, and designed uh, when he became an academic, a thing called systemic operational design, which created a lot of problems, but uh, was a really interesting way of looking at, uh, at problems and trying to change the way planning was. But his real line was that the best generals ask the best question. Uh, and so strip out general and just put leader. And I think that is the that is the key thing here, because what you're really trying to do is, um, particularly in a hierarchical organization, is give people uh, the permission to come back to you with ideas. Uh, and by you asking a question, you're telling them, oh, I haven't got the answer to this. And I'm interested in what you think. Um, so that instantly cuts through a whole range of barriers uh, to that as you engage up and down an organization. Yeah. And it is a really good way of bringing people in. So a lot of it is, um, you know, sometimes you know what you don't you don't know. And so that can be a very, you know, question that you can structure and give to someone um, and they can go away and get that back for you. Sometimes you don't know. So you're really testing the outer boundaries of your knowledge. And I think here we've had a little bit of that um, and right across the board because we really, as we started off, didn't really know how far we could go with the whole digital thing and where that might lead. And so you're constantly asking people what else they've seen, what they can bring um, into the party to try and boost the capability. And I think that will become increasingly important as we go through. So I think that's that's one thing. I do think there is a um, there is a piece around uh, in military terms. So, so part of what you've got to do is set the direction uh, and the tone and the vision. And you've got to get people to get their heads up because in that react bit that I was talking about, what people tend to do is focus right down on the immediate, which is fine. But you've got to get the leadership and the more senior people looking further forward, because if they don't, what happens is you just solve problems. You're just running along and you're reacting. And a lesson I learned really early in my um, time from a from a great um, general who's the commanding division when we were on ops. And we we'd had a big incident um, which we had addressed. And he just looked at me and said, you know, so what's going on? I started explain what we'd done. Um, and then he said, so, yeah, but what that's all dictated by them. What are you doing to them now? What, what's going on now? And I sort of looked at him and went, blimey, you know, I'm up to my eyes with all this stuff. We've got everything. And you're asking me to go to, to, to sort of get on the front foot further forward, you know. And, um, and that, But he was absolutely right. And I think this situation we have is a competition. I mean, I know it's a really weird one because it's a virus. Um, but actually, it's the effect that that's having on us. And if, it, if we're dictated to by that, we will not really flourish and get out on the front foot. And we kind of need to do that. And that's why this term that you'll have heard me use um, in the university is we've got to change the thing from defense and protecting. So everybody's staying inside and we've got to learn to live and work with the virus because otherwise we're going to be sitting in our houses for the next two years. Well, that, that kind of ain't going to work for a load of businesses and things that we want to do and society. So. We've got to start working out how we live and work effectively with this thing around us. Uh, and I think there is a bit of leadership around that in, in being prepared to put yourself at risk to a degree uh, and getting out there. And that is something that is very common to what we do on ops. Julian, thanks for those insights. And actually, it's something that I, it is, is clearly um, a commonality between some of the conversations we've been having is this subject of, of, of leadership, which I know is, is something that we have a very strong shared interest in and, uh, and perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll put back to that thing but one of the things that really struck me when you were talking about, about that is the is, is the is the way that is the attitude that you have as a leader to what you're confronted with if I can just put it in those broad terms we are confronted with something that perhaps nobody has seen before but actually what happens in the military is you become trained in methods for dealing with that and your point about thinking about it not as not, not as an, a defensive reaction but something that you can get on top of Get uh, you know, get get ahead of seems to me to be one of the key key facets of our response to this, doesn't it? And, and, and by and large, what you're seeing in resilient organisations is them doing that right now. You know, seeing what is it that we need to do to be able to to be successful in what you've been saying to us, which is a living with COVID world as opposed to one that's just going to return to some normality there. So absolutely, and I think the you know the other thing is we all see businesses around us. Some of them have shut up shop. 
and have really done yeah. nothing waiting for something to happen. Others have invented, gone out and done a whole load of different things. And funnily enough, we'll, they're the businesses we'll remember and they're the ones we'll support later on. So I think, you know, there really is opportunity to occupy gaps, uh, a void that is uh, gifted to you in many ways by others' response. Uh, and you've got to get in there and use that, I think. Uh, one of the things that's emerged actually quite frequently from, from these webinars is, is, the, is the capacity to scenario plan, to look, to look at, at, at lots of different types of future and then work out how you can be resilient and successful in any one of those features, which is the fundamental part of scenario planning, which is a business technique, if I can bring the business element into that. I don't know, we've been doing that at the university, um, and I'm sure that's been happening in, in, in Soraya's and, and Gordon's world. And uh, perhaps I'm going to just see that if we can have a third attempt at uh, bringing Gordon back. And, oh, no, just as I said, you, you, you can rely on it, can't you? So, <laughs> as I go, and he's, go, he's off again. Uh, Gordon's obviously having real problems with the, with the technology, which is, of course, ironic, given what we're talking about here. Um, I know that at, at one of our, uh, certainly at the university, one of the, and around Lincolnshire, one of our big concerns was how would bandwidth sustain all, all this virtual stuff. And uh, on the whole, it's done pretty well, but it, it does fail us occasionally. So, um, so Soraya, perhaps I'd like come back to you on, on the subject of leadership, because one of the things that you, you did mention uh, and is one of the key planks of your role, of course, is, is um, I, I suppose, managing the, um, the, 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 um, the work of leadership in the RF through the TEDA and through the Robson Academy. So, so what's going on in that space then? I mean, is it is it challenging our concept of leadership? The current crisis is it is it is it is, are we saying actually you know our idea of leadership was spot on because it's allowing us to deal with it? I mean, what, what's happening in terms of, of the way we develop the RF is developing its thinking and leadership? So, so I think um, you know it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think actually our, our our concept of leadership, certainly in, in the RAF, is one that is very flexible and obviously context based. And this idea that you change your leadership style and, and requirements on, on the on the situation that we're presented with is, I think, something that we're relatively familiar with in, in the Air Force. Um, I think the context is different. You know, we're now dealing with a distributed workforce. That's something that the military has not had to deal with before, this working from home. You know, we tend to be people who like to be in work. We're, we're, we like being with other people. So this idea of isolation, of, of remoteness, uh, of being detached from everything that you're used to, I think requires different considerations in terms of leadership. And certainly on on the uh, sort of uh, TEDA uh, Academy of Leadership, we've been focusing on webinars on leading yourself, but also leading in crisis, trying to deal with isolation, trying to uh, cope with those aspects that are, that are new and very different for us. Um, I think, though, you know, going back to something that Julian said earlier, this, this you know, being able to be resilient as an organisation and get on is absolutely key. Um, and I think the one thing that really helps us do that in the military is our, our risk management. I mean, clearly, we, we always undertake a range of different activities that present quite considerable risks to lives. But this is something that we're used to dealing with, and we have a well, very well-developed uh, kind of uh, method of, of dealing with that. You know, the output has to remain the same, but, you know, we, we are pretty agile and uh, adaptive in, in what we do and how we meet it. Using our risk management and duty holding system really to mitigate uh, risks where we can and obviously keep it to a level that is tolerable and as low as, as reasonably practical, uh, but also accepting risks where we need to, where the output is uh, so important and critical that it warrants it. And I think that uh, method really helps us to get through this. And whilst I think the first few weeks of the lockdown were quite turbulent as we sort of got our head around this very new threat and this very new situation, I think we're now, certainly if I look at my sort of part of the, the enterprise, we're in this new way of normal now, we're dealing with it, we're adapting. Um, and absolutely key is empowering our people to make the right decisions, you know, giving them your overall uh, intent. This is what we have to achieve. You know, these are your freedoms. You know, you have the expertise, you have the knowledge, you make the decisions, you make the recommendations. So I think that empowerment of our people is absolutely key in how we get after the task. It, it's, uh, thank you, Sarah. It's, I, I, have, I find the sentence too fascinating, as you know, I've done a little bit of work with the Teller myself, but actually, um, people perhaps perhaps less familiar with the military, um, reflecting on something that Julian was was saying as well that uh, this idea of, of of empowering leaders, of trusting those in, underneath you, um, as as Julian put it, um, you know, as a lead, leader, making sure you're asking the right questions of people, not necessarily um, being in a kind of um, what we might sort of characterise as a as a command and control relationship. These are 
these seem to me to be characteristics of of of, of effective leadership in in any context but you're saying that these are now really becoming um uh, to the fore in the situation that we're we're faced with um is, is that a is that a reasonable um statement to make so uh, absolutely uh, you know i think again you know in the air force um you know that we like to empower our people uh we try and give them mission command you know uh, we want people to be responsible we want people to innovate and and you know come up with the solutions themselves so this is absolutely again you know ingrained in our sort of dna and you know something that we try to be better at as, as we go through the years uh, again situations like this crises like this are you know great opportunities for really moving moving it to a different level moving it to where you want to be not just to kind of where you are uh, at the moment so you know it, it, it is it is very interesting and i think you know we've got to look at these crises as opportunities for other things as well uh, and really take those opportunities where we can get them Thanks, Roy, which definitely seems to be a theme from our discussion, doesn't it? Which, uh, as Julian pointed out, that there are some organisations that are kind of batting down the hatches and waiting for the storm to blow over. And and, and I think our instinct, isn't it, that, that actually that's, uh, if you can sort of help it, that's the wrong approach, which actually is sort of looking and uh, redeveloping your business model, redeveloping your the, the ways that you're working. Um, that's essentially the crisis response, that the, the, the organisations who are going to see their way through this is, uh, are, are going to be su successful in, I think. So now we have had uh, one uh, comment um, from, one of our, uh, from one of our listeners, uh, Howard Stein, who's actually uh, joining us from Switzerland, just to say how international our, our uh, webinar is. And, and, uh, and, and as has asked a question, which, which perhaps, Raya, you, you can follow on from your previous answer. He's asking, is this a new paradigm for military for the 21st century, sort of agility, resilience? Um, good governance and, and and leadership. Are we, uh, you know, in this, are we in that position of, of defining a, a new paradigm for military leadership? So, right, would you say? Um, so, um, in the Royal Air Force, we have something called Astra, uh, which is the chief's uh, vision for basically the Air Force and our journey over the next, um, you know, couple of decades, sort of 2030, 2035, and beyond. Uh, the idea being that we really try and, um, you know speed up that journey and get to where we want to be or need to be in, in sort of 2030, 2040 now. Um, so all of these things like agile, resilient, good government, uh, good governance, leadership, empowerment of our people, you know, recognizing that many of the good ideas and the innovation in the hierarchical organization is often at the bottom end of uh, that hierarchy. So giving them the opportunity uh, to sort of push their ideas up and, and, and empowering them to, to act on them. This is absolutely what the Air Force is aspiring to do and doing with its with its Astra journey. So, so I don't think it's a new paradigm for us. I think, as I say, what it has has been a is a catalyst, and it's maybe leapt us forward two or three years uh, in terms of the journey that we were on anyway, uh, and really forced us to make quite radical, um, you know, uh, decisions and ways of working, which we would have done anyway, but we're doing it now. We're doing it immediately. Yeah, indeed, and and I know, <clears throat> excuse me, from some of the work that uh, that I've been doing with um, with the Tether and with, with Project Mercury at, uh, at Officer Training, <clears throat> excuse me, is recognising the fact that um, a, a new generation we kind of refer to as Generation Z occasionally, you know, they're sort of they're actually coming into the military with a very different sort of value set, aren't they? And their their expectations of of military leadership can can sometimes be very different from um, from what we've seen before, almost regardless of the current crisis. So. Is that one of the trends that you're you're referring to? That you're saying actually there was a shift going on anyway? Is that have you been factoring that in in terms of thinking on leadership? Yeah, I think that's one of the factors um, that that requires us to change. Is that society has changed and we've got to keep up. But actually, I think you know we recognise that um, if the organisation still wants to be world leading, we have to modernise. We have to start capitalising on all of the, the you know. The work and uh, that, that's out there in terms of how to get the best out of our people. You know, any organisation needs to be doing that. Um, so, so yes, those are those are those are key factors, definitely. Um, fantastic, thanks, Raya. And uh, and one of, that I'll put up, and, and actually, Julian, you, you may uh, also be able to pick in this, if I may, it's from uh, from Howard Howard Ganaway. So, and and I'll just just read this out. as following on from your thought, as and reflecting on how many med medics or scientists are saying that we need to think of the COVID nineteen challenge less as a battle or more of a way to live with it. Does this also have relevance to the new ways of dealing with conflict in the military political conflict? Julian, you, you mentioned this point about the you know, living with COVID. Is, uh, it, can, can you give us your reflection on this? Is this something that uh, 
um, that, that is relevant potentially to dealing with conflict, coming back to that that sort of um, you know military war peace type analogy, Julian? Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I'd, I'd absolutely agree with uh, Sarai that I, I don't think the, you know, the standard bits of what we want to be able to do in an organisation around resilience, agility, all of those things were, were required. And certainly in an army context uh, distributed on the battlefield across Iraq and Afghanistan in small groups, you were relying on people to do the right thing uh, and you couldn't actually reach down and touch them. So <clears throat> I think we've been trying to build those in for a long time. Uh, we're now trying to do it in a very different uh, sort of digital environment as opposed to uh, a fiscal environment, and that, that does have changes. Uh, in terms of the direct question now, uh, it's another factor, I think, uh, rather than it necessarily changing everything. I mean, you know, if you watch what happened with uh, the deployment around Ebola and how, that, how the military um, supported people uh, there, the approach is quite similar. Obviously, the physical manifestation is different in terms of the equipment people having to wear, the deployment, the fact that you can't mix and so on. So in some ways, it's it's just another planning constraint in terms of how you deal with things. And fun enough, might take uh, those of us who are old enough to remember being uh, in the sort of Cold War element uh, and in NBC kit with uh, great big face masks on uh, and everything else where you couldn't speak to anyone really. You tried, but it was a bit of a joke um, and really encumbered by equipment. Of course, the key element with that, um, you know, as a young subby out in Germany, um, sorry, young lieutenant running around in, um, in Germany in those conditions, we were put into that stuff all the time. Uh, to just to, to build your ability um, to operate in it and survive in it because actually it is really debilitating if the weather is at all warm you are sweating buckets and we're already hearing that from the NHS in certain areas where it is the equipment they're having to wear to deal with cases is having a real impact on the length of time that they can operate yeah. and then of course it's a real uh, logistical nightmare because they're having to come in and out of this equipment recover back into new equipment so they're using more equipment because they you know you just physically can't stay in the stuff so i think as uh as a factor it is and the debilitation that comes from it it is something that would have to be factored in because just thinking back what it meant was we had to look at how long people could operate for bringing and rotating people so shift patterns had to be reduced and so on which then also has a, an effect of expanding your organization if you're going to be truly effective now that in this situation is really difficult um because people haven't can't afford the cost. So you've got to work out how fast you cycle people. But um, so there are, for the military, it, I think it's a it's a degrading on your capacity to operate in the fiscal environment, which will have to be taken into account and worked through. I mean, you've got a plan for resilience in your people, which means working in teams and shifts. So that if one person goes, you know, we all know if someone gets it in your team or, or whatever, that's a whole team out until you can work out who has or hasn't got it. Uh, and they can recover and the next team comes on. But that, I think, also is is going to have to happen in business, um, particularly through the winter as we prepare for flu and everything else that might come along and that sort of exacerbating effect. How are you going to make sure that your organisation can operate in that environment and, and still deliver and keep your business going until we can get to a point where you can start to expand again? I think that's the, that is the key challenge in this, I think. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Julian. I, I, I must say that you know one of the things that uh, that your your response reminds me of, of course, is uh, one of the most notable aspects of responding to the crisis was when the military stepped in to, uh, to assist the NHS with their logistics operations and and, and assisted them um, most notably with setting up the Nightingale hospitals. Um, in, in, in your view, does does that say something about the the the, the kind of um, the, the value set within the military that allows them to be able to, to to respond to the crisis in the way that you've been talking about doesn't is that an example in other words of, of what you've been what you've been showing with it, you say, you? um yeah i think uh so i have a bit of insight into this just because a, uh, a very friend of mine is uh has been at the heart of trying to sort out some of this logistics piece i yeah. think I mean, that's, really, really, that's, why, <laughs> that's why i asked the question <laughs> really interesting is um uh, it would be that. So the reason the military can do what the military does is because, in general, not everybody would agree with this um, in terms of the uh, logistics. But in our general approach, it isn't necessarily um, it, just in time. So we do hold stock. We 
do still have a, um, a framework and own that framework for logistics and delivery and so on. So we can rely on ourselves and uh, we can connect and push everything through. So it's so it's all held. The reflection, I think, on the NHS is less a reflection on the NHS, um, but it's that first um, it's that first letter national. And the NHS isn't a national organisation. It is a federation of a lot of little things grouped together, or little, some of them are obviously very big. But that means there isn't a national logistic, NHS national logistics. So when you're trying to roll something through and control, prioritise, move things to the place of greatest need, that is really hard in a, in a system that isn't joined up. And it absolutely isn't joined up. So I think it ex exposes um, the... Being federated and having stuff pushed out, um, contracting a load of stuff out, really efficient when you're when what you're after is efficiency, speed and so on uh, in a normal environment. When you're in a crisis and actually it's the whole thing, it's not just one area, but it's nationally. Uh, that isn't the answer. You then need something that is actually all joined up and you can centralise and make the decisions about where the greatest need is and direct it. And that has been their challenge, I think. And from a business perspective, Julie, reflecting on that, I mean, it seems to have been one of the, one of the most important strategic considerations for organisations that those extended global supply chains that have been supporting businesses suddenly have been absolutely threatened and in some cases cut. And I, I just find that's a really interesting strategic question that one of our uh, one of our listeners has already already asked actually as to whether that's going to be a long term effect. About uh, I think the term that we're now using is reshoring. You know, bringing uh, bringing business back into uh, into an area that we can control, i.e., the borders of the of the UK. And, and perhaps um, Soraya, I, I, from the RAF perspective, I don't know whether that's a, a relevant question or not. But I think it would be really interesting to get your perspective about um, from a broader uh, point of view. Um, whether and, and how uh, you think the, the current crisis uh, is going to affect, the, can I say, the way that the RAF does its business, if I may? I mean, because the RAF in many ways is a, is a global organisation, as we know. So it, is, there, is there something that's going on here that's going to make some fundamental changes to the way the RAF is structured, its strategy and its, its approach to its, its business, if I can call it? Um, so I think, I think yes, it's, uh, especially if... if the COVID crisis is here to stay for, for a, a fair amount of time it is. And also if the, if the nation goes into what we expect to be a recession for a number of years, I think the impact is going to be uh, wide ranging. It's certainly going to affect, uh, you know, the military, not only in terms of, uh, you know, funding, but also in terms of, you know, in recessions, we, we tend to do quite well in terms of employing people. You know, we are we're obviously a large uh, employer, not just in the efforts, but across defence. Um, I think one of the really interesting things uh, and something that the Air Force and the military as a whole uh, was grappling with is, as a hierarchical organisation, you know, how do we do lateral entry? How do we change? How do we modernise? How do we capitalise on the advantages and diversity and skill sets um, that a lateral entry um, system would allow? And I think one of the really interesting things that will be interesting to see how that develops over the next couple of years, obviously with lots of people potentially looking for employment, lots of opportunities to get in, um, you know, skill sets that uh, would take years to train otherwise. Um, so I think that may may be an opportunity that, that will, will be explored certainly over the next few years. Um, I think in terms of our core assets, obviously, you know, uh, the Defence of the Nation operations overseas, largely unaffected. Um, we'll, we'll have to sort of work around the restrictions just as we are doing now, but our core outputs uh, will clearly uh, remain uh, you know, much as they ever were. I think it's more the way we do business. I think we will modernise as an organisation uh, our sort of normal routine uh, ways of working. I think that sort of cultural shift that we were hoping to get will just come sooner. So this idea, so uh, thank you. So this idea of uh, particularly what you were referring to earlier, uh, of getting used to this idea of working remotely, working individually, um, not necessarily being phys physically present in order to be to be able to do your job effectively. That was one of the things that you, you'd identified as being a, 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 a potential core cultural shift for the forces in the same way that it is for most businesses. So is that is that the kind of thing you're referring to in terms of that, that potentially permanent change? Yeah, very much so. Um, and, and I think, you know, this idea of uh, flexible working is is I think one of the big benefits that have come, uh, have come out of this. We've seen in certain parts of our enterprise that we can be highly effective, sometimes even more effective, um, 
people, you know, so long as you've got the connectivity and the infrastructure sort of back, some technical infrastructure to support it, uh, we can be we can be highly productive. Uh, and of course, at the moment where we've got, you know, um, even though with key worker status, we've got, um, you know, children at home, childcare issues, you know, the, the dynamics are, are vastly different from, from uh, what they normally are. So I think having the ability to adapt um, and still maintain an output and still, uh, you know, maintain what we need to do, um, I think is, is, is really, really key. Mm. And, and, and I know that uh, that uh, the, the, the Chief of the Air Staff, Mike Wigston, has been, um, you know, one of the things he's prioritised, of course, is, uh, is, is diversity and inclusion in, in the RAF. And that, of course, is, was going on um, before the crisis. Uh, and it, it sounds like one of the things that you may be hinting at is actually that that may well provide a, a source of strength for the future of the RAF as well, in, in order, particularly in relevance of dealing with, um, uh, with with a with a slightly more diverse way of working. Actually, I suppose if I can just link those two things. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I hope it, it may make us more attractive as an organisation for those. You know, greater flexibility will appeal to um, you know different people. That will also help us to retain um, you know people who otherwise would have been forced out because they just can't juggle the pressures of family or whatever and, and moving around. So so I think it does present a real opportunity and, and you're right, you know, we absolutely need to be a more diverse organisation. Um, it's it's one of our key uh, aspirations in ASCA. You know, we, we need to represent the society uh, that we protect and defend uh, and we would benefit, you know, massively as an organisation with, uh, with with more diversity, just in the way we think, in the way that uh, it makes us more agile, it makes us better at what we do. So, uh, you know, real priorities for the Air Force. And I think this, you know, new way of working, more flexibility, potential to move in and out. I mean, who knows? I mean, I think there's there's the, there's a, a lot of really exciting prospects to be to be explored, really, in the coming uh, months, weeks, months and years. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and Julian, perhaps uh, from, from our perspective, uh, looking at it as a university and also as a business, actually, I mean, I, I must come back to the uh, to the framework that you mentioned, the, uh, the four R's, the, the reset, resilience, recovery, uh, new reality and, and renewal. Um, do you think this is something that, um, that, that businesses generally can, can, can learn from? I mean, what, you know, from your perspective, as having used that as, as, a, as a university business, if I can say that, how would you suggest businesses um, may look at that. Is it a is it a kind of a sequence of things they have to go through? Is it something that you're aware of and you can jump back into the room? Is it something that's useful for businesses? You say a bit more about it because I know you've been you've been taking us through it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I think it is something that we can use um, and more and more widely, uh, absolutely. Uh, because I think the interesting thing about this situation is even now government is um, preparing and telling people that you know. We, will slowly evolve out of lockdown uh, but in the background there's a heck of a lot of work going on about how we go back into lockdown whether it's regionally uh, in certain areas at hotspots or, um, or or nationally again depending on, on what happens so we those four areas you know we, we may well have to react again um, so that you know we now hopefully next time we'll have will have changed all our planning business continuity incident protocols all those sorts of things um, and worked it out because actually the interesting thing I was having this discussion with um, Caroline Lowe, who some will know, who's our um, who's really sort of the, our chief planning, if you like, uh, across strategic plans, but also looks after business continuity. And none of us had in our business continuity denial of your entire university physical space. Um, so that, but but now we kind of realise that, uh, and I think there so. That is one area, but of course, the other thing that we have seen um, in moving everything online, uh, and the stats are really stark, are the um, uh, cyber attacks against educational establishments, because we've had to advertise that we've done this to stay alive, if you like, and to maintain and deliver. So, of course, uh, organised crime, and that is where some of this stuff is coming from, knows the stakes are massive for universities to be able to do that. So so the next thing that I that uh, chatting to Caroline was saying, OK, so we need to change the plans. We need to, you know, learn everything that we've got now from denial of our physical space. What about denial of our digital space? What happens if, we, if that happens? What you know, what are we doing and thinking about how we would recover from that if someone suddenly did that? What does that mean for us? So there's more that might be the next react, if you like. We really need to get ahead of that, I think. The resilience bit, yes, and I think because everybody has got to be thinking about that now, um, about how they how they sort themselves out, and will will respond if we um, if we have to again. 
recovery clearly i think everybody's focused on that is you know how do i get out of this and keep my business going uh, and how do i develop it and the new reality well we're all we're all living with that and i think some of those things that um sarai has said are absolutely spot on as well for for wider business certainly for the university in that the um it allows us the opportunity for people to balance responsibilities and commitments better it allows us to vary the working pattern of the day um, to enable people to do to take on their caring responsibilities or whatever else it is that they've got and still work it, we know that it's had a massive impact on the green uh, on our on our uh, carbon uh, emissions just as a university i mean it's absolutely changed that whole dynamic because we haven't got everybody queuing up in cars everybody can park at the university now um so you you know all of those other benefits can start to to feed through and we kind of need to remember remember those and then build on those because i'm sure in the future carbon charging carbon taxation is all coming uh, and we will be you know we will be held to account for that and have to pay for it in a different way so some of the things there it, it really will allow us to exploit and i think the other thing is that there's a great comment in in the um chat about whether this is the end of the global piece uh, or is everything coming back on i don't think everything will come back on i think people will try and put in place to give us more resilience so that we don't have an immediate shock so like the um initial phases where we saw jews out and all over the place because we couldn't produce the stuff internally but actually the different working patterns that we're doing and, it, and being able to extend the working day mean and this is particularly relevant for us it absolutely is for the military is that we can operate um internationally at hours that suit our people and the other people at the other end yeah. um, and we know that in terms of teaching expanding our online provision getting more international online you know there are some interesting things and the american uh navy have a really interesting way of uh, of delivering their education for their senior leaders so their advanced course if you like you can do that residential in a lovely site on the coast um you can do it uh online uh you can do it the online bit is global and then they divide people up but the lecturers actually are online late at night so that they can talk to those guys that got in korea and so on uh, and even for those stuck in nuclear submarines you can still do it uh, with a cd disc wrong poof back it in and then it all gets sent in when they finally come up off the bottom but i think you know those are the sorts of things that uh, these different working patterns uh, and how we then contract or our employment contracts are going to have to flex as well uh, because a standard boilerplate contract nine to five or whatever just ain't going to do it anymore and we need to have more range and it also means we can utilize our buildings better over a longer period of time so that upfront investment gets used and so on so there are some efficiencies that come as well uh, and i think can help our staff as well it's not just about the business i think we're giving greater flexibility to people to operate yeah absolutely thank, thank you so much julian and, and sarai did you want to just come back in on that you know, it's interesting just uh, going to the sort of global, you know, are we going to sort of batten down yeah. the board and look at this? You know, I, I, I don't believe so. I mean, okay, right now the focus is on national resilience. It has to be. We've got to get through this stage. But I think very quickly, you know, we've still got Brexit. Uh, we've still got the government's aspiration for, for global Britain, which would become increasingly important, really, to help us recover from this recession. So, you know, my, my sense is that these are going to become priorities really quite quickly again we will maybe have to adapt the way that we do it and and try and consider uh, the implications of, of the virus and how we manage it and, and maintain risk at a reasonable level but i think you know uh, being global as a nation is 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 a key part of recovery i 100 percent agree and I, some, some of the work that uh, we mentioned young, uh, younger generation as well when we work with our uh, 18 year olds as you do in the military Sarai, when you when you talk to them they are part of a global population that's how they see themselves and and so you know if, if we as 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 a sort of uh, a, a current generation of people or even a historical generation of leaders think that globalization is going away just talk to them because they absolutely don't see it that way they absolutely feel part of a global generation that has all sorts of effects from, from the environment from social from a, a common global set of of, um, of values so uh, we would be doing them a massive disservice and it just for me gives us that massive confidence actually that, that that it will come back and they will make sure that it does actually if we don't so, uh, so I, I would absolutely agree to that. So, um, so I think that is a, a fantastic note for us to uh, to finish our conversation on. Um, so it really just remains for me to to, to thank uh, Soraya, um, Soraya Marshall, Commodore Marshall, and uh, former Brigadier General Julian Free, um, current Deputy Vice Chancellor at University of Lincoln, 
um, for joining us and giving us so much of your time this morning for what I hope for our listeners has been a, a fascinating conversation and certainly for me has been um, really insightful. So thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, and at that point, I shall hand back to our host, uh, Martin. Martin? Thank you very much, Craig. And thank you, everyone. Obviously, it's a real shame we lost Gordon there in the conversation. Chatting to him beforehand, I know he had some amazing things to bring across, so hopefully we'll be able to bring those back at a later time. Well done, Craig, for managing through that. Well done, panel, for speaking more than probably you thought you'd have to. Uh, you did a really good job. Um, just before I uh, sort of finish the broadcast, just to let you know, uh, we've got some more things coming up next week on the executive education stream. So next week, we've got on the 27th of May at 10 o'clock in the morning, accounting systems and emergency management with Dr. Judith John. Um, and also worth mentioning, if anyone is interested in learning at a distance, um, it's not just the military who do this with the University of Lincoln, a lot of people in the civilian world do as well. If you want to drop an email to askwbdl at lincoln.ac.uk, that's work-based distance learning for those who are wondering, um, we would be delighted to connect with you on that front. And just a final thought really, I thought it was a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for your thoughts and input. It strikes me there's still this inherent tension we're facing at the moment between this tumultuous change that we are all going through, and yet a lot of things haven't changed. Uh, and it's just balancing those things off. So as, as Julian said, you know, um, best generals ask the best questions. And, and Soraya talks about looking to the future. That's never changed. That's always been relevant and really fascinating discussion today. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Craig. And we look forward to speaking to you all again and seeing you very soon. Thank you very much.